the way I feel about meeting Kate is the same to Matt and Thomas. That's me. I'm Kate Ward. I feel the exact same, you know, divine intervention and this just sense of, you know, there's something bigger than us at play. She, she just, she feels like family to me. I think nobody understands to the depth that she does what Yes Theory is trying to do in the world. I've been part of the Yes Theory team since 2019. And let me tell you, it's been quite the year and a half. My path first crossed with Matt, Thomas, and Amars when they saw this article I wrote about the Yes Theory business model. I argued that great companies like Nike and Apple started with a product, and only afterward did they try to create a philosophy around that product. New companies that have the potential to be great, like Yes Theory, started instead with a philosophy and then built products out of that. Yes Theory was one of the first companies I'd seen executing this kind of inverse business model right. But the truth is, I didn't care about Yes Theory because of the business model. I wrote that article from the darkest place I'd ever been. I'm not going to tell you my whole life story or anything because this isn't my podcast. But the spark notes is that I was dealing with a textbook quarter life crisis. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the first ever Seek Discomfort Fashion Show. Hopefully, hopefully one out of many of them. And for whatever reason, watching these three dudes jump out of airplanes and connect with strangers across the world made me feel hopeful. After falling down a yesterday rabbit hole, the idea of seeking discomfort stuck with me. It was a compass for my healing, and I knew it could be for a lot of other people too. When people ask me about my role at Yes Theory, the easy answer is that I'm one of their managers. But the truth is, I wear so many hats that sometimes I get confused about where my work starts and ends. You may find me wearing the therapist hat, the mama bear hat, the producer hat, chief negotiator hat, the human resources hat, the creative executive hat. But on my first day on the job a year and a half ago, I was just wearing a newbie hat. We are currently editing the top snaps for the first 30 videos that are going to air on Snapchat. If you're seeing this in the videos... Who are that, you talking to? You? To our future selves. If you're seeing like in a year from now... We were in the living room of Omar and Thomas's apartment. Right away, I knew this wasn't going to be a normal job. Thomas was curled up under this fuzzy pink blanket, and Matt had his arm around me. They ordered sushi for lunch. They were all grabbing at it like brothers, not coworkers reaching over each other, using their hands, the whole thing. I'm allergic, so I just kind of pretended to eat it. After lunch, we got on perfecting Yes Theory's why statement. Now, if you don't know, a why statement is an idea popularized by Simon Sinek. I call it the golden circle. Why, how, what? This little idea explains why some organizations and some leaders are able to inspire where others aren't. Let me define the terms really quick. It basically explains what you do as a business and why. There's also a personal why, which is just what you do and why you do it. Boiling down your reason for being into a few words is a lot harder than you think. Now imagine doing that with a group of people who all think this statement is their baby. They were battling over the use of one word for at least 40 minutes. Were they trying to activate or build a community? I chimed in here and there, but mostly I just watched. I never sat with a group of men that were so honest with each other, or that seemed to care so much. It's important to mention this meeting was right on the tail of many of their big moments as a group. The, Grand Can the fact that the Grand Canyon is right below you, Yo. that is, like, if it's just Halle Bungie, it's like, it's, it's exciting. The shots that that camera is getting looks insane. Oh Amar and Will Smith had bungee jumped out of a helicopter over the Grand Canyon. Yes. But hold on, somebody actually suggested this might not be Justin I Bieber. Read this. They, said they launched a burrito Justin stunt with a fake Justin Bieber that went mega viral. I'm a simple man, yet I'm going to change the world. And created a brilliant, impactful documentary with the Iceman, Wim Hof. But along with that success came a lot of pressure. Not only had the last year been a whirlwind, but they were also growing up, which is kind of hard to do when you're so embedded in such a tight-knit group. Right before I came on board, they'd made the hard decision to move out of the first house they'd lived in together here in Venice, fondly referred to as 506. As a viewer, 506 had felt like a character in their videos. That's where basically every creative idea was born, every master plan was written. There was even a shack in the backyard that the editors worked from. The house was a stone's throw away from Abbott Kinney, the street they'd walk up and down asking strangers random questions. Right. You guys wanna come skinny dipping with us? Yeah, that'd be awesome. Actually? I guess I was sarcastic. So we're looking to go on a night swim with new friends. <laughs> I've walked down that very street with just one of them, 
usually on the way to pick up an afternoon coffee or some Swedish candy. And nine times out of ten, when any single one of them gets recognized, the person yells out, Hey, yes, theory! In the world, they really aren't known as Matt, Thomas, and Amar. They're known as a unit. And back at the beginning of 2019, that place that tied them together wasn't going to be there for them anymore. Instead, they had to channel their shared purpose. And ever since, they've been in the seemingly never-ending dance of needing to carve out a sense of individuality, all while still putting the collective mission and vision first. They aren't perfect at it, none of us are. But Matt, Thomas, and Amar are trying to do something that I think a lot of us hope we can do in life, which is to live and build and work with people that we love. Welcome to the Yes Theory Podcast. I'm Kate Ward. I'm Matt Daher. I'm Amar Kandil. And I'm Thomas Bragg. We'll get into it after the break. At the start of this year, my only goal was to cook more. In 2019, I spent far too much money on takeout, and I realized I missed just throwing on a super jazzy playlist and making something for myself. And like my mom always used to say, food tastes better when you work for it. But the problem is, I'm one of the many millennial poster children for workaholism. I get home late. I usually end up settling for some version of the same old stir-fry, or another round of takeout. That's where Green Chef comes in. Green Chef is a USDA-certified organic company that makes eating well easy and affordable, with plans to fit every lifestyle. I can plan what meals I want to make in advance, come home, make them pretty quickly, and eat well and delicious. Green Chef's expert chefs design flavorful recipes that cover all kinds of lifestyles and dietary restrictions. And using Green Chef, I feel like I'm learning how to cook more creatively without wasting a bunch of time or having too many leftovers at the end of the week. Cue the jazz. Green Chef has an incredible variety of high-quality, clean ingredients so you can feel great about what you're eating and feel good about how the food got to your table. Green Chef is the most sustainable meal kit, and they offset 100% of its direct carbon emissions and plastic packaging in every box. Go to greenchef.com slash yestheory80 and use the code yestheory80 to get $80 off four boxes, including free shipping on your first box. Again, that's greenchef.com slash yestheory80 and use the code yestheory80 to get $80 off four boxes, including free shipping on your first box. Through the last year and a half, I've come to believe that the guy's friendship is the foundation of everything Yes Theory is. It's the source of their creativity, their growth, their success. But because they are best friends, business partners, and at times even roommates, it's difficult to get space. And although it may look great online, there's a lot of messiness that unfolds when the cameras aren't rolling. Each of them has almost quit or shut down Yes Theory a few times. But ultimately, Each co-founder's personal desires are so intertwined with their shared purpose that they recommit. They've taught me a lot, but the biggest lesson is this. True, lasting relationships require honesty, open dialogue, and sometimes space. So today's episode is a bit different. It's a conversation we recorded between Thomas, Matt, and Amar. Just like I got to be a fly on that wall in that very first Yes Theory meeting, you get to be one now and observe one of their many conversations about business, life, and friendship. Before we start... Well, we should probably preface by saying that we are having this conversation in our basement with life happening outside. So if you're hearing some of this life, then welcome to our basement. All right, now we'll get into it. I, I've just been thinking about our relationship a lot, where it's at, how it's evolved, what's the future look like. And what about it? Lots of gratitude for it, first and foremost. But feeling like what got us from A to B won't get us from B to wherever we want to go. And I think this is the the discomfort of this next phase. I feel like there's a bit of reliance on this beautiful history and moments of serendipity and how we met. And it's a story that has become like idolized and told a lot that almost we live out our friendship out of that story rather than out of the present moment of how, how we're actually feeling connected to each other. The time that we spend with each other outside of, outside of what we do. Every relationship, romantic, platonic, familial, has a narrative. One that embodies the nature of the relationship itself. It's what you return to when things get rough. It's like the mythology of a friendship. It's so tricky being storytellers and thinking about our own story in retrospect, right? I always thought 
the the general time of when we all met as a magical time because it was a it was like a shared desire to break the rules in a way but that felt very loving and actually intentional and for me to like you're the first stranger i ever ever hosted on my couch so there, there's a lot of magic to me in the way that it happened you know when i review the moments where that like passion about the relationship is expressed i often find myself having been the one to voice that so i start to question whether that's a shared view about how we see this relationship and what it means or is that just like more amplified for me because of certain emotional experiences in life of having like a family that I'm connected to that don't exist for me. I recognize this fear quite well. I've felt it many times myself. I've worried whether the story I'm telling myself about a relationship is true or whether I'm just trying to prevent it from ending. But the only way to know is to really talk it through with the other person. Just, yeah, I feel like wanting to just figure out the ways that we can be proactive about the relationship because it's a pretty, uh, it's a pretty special one, and it needs to, it needs to be handled with like a lot of care and a lot of proactive investment on our end, so that we don't end up <coughs> like finding ourselves at a point in time where we're all looking and being like, whoa, how did we all just end up here? I actually think we never had to be proactive about our friendship. I actually think it's not a muscle that we ever had to practice because we one would either always be filming together so we would find ourselves right in like hotel rooms after traveling or talking or backing up whatever like we would just like stumble into situation that would nurture our friendship or into creative disagreements that would then force us to sit down and talk and i think now that we're actually not living together anymore i think we all need to build that muscle of being proactive about it yeah, I think I agree more with the it just not being ever something that was practiced because of the convenience of creating a lifestyle that actually creates the moments where friendships thrive. As we evolve as individuals, we evolve as a unit. That's difficult though, right? It takes a long time. And I think the, the two forces of us, one like not all living together any, anymore and then also having the realization that I think we were too codependent. Those in a codependent relationship lean so heavily on one another that everyone is left off balance. In their desperation to have their needs met, their true identities are distorted. And their development and potential, personally, socially, and professionally, gets stifled. On the flip side, having no social ties isn't healthy either. There has to be a balance between healthy dependence and independence. I realized that my own ups and downs were still completely bound to your both of yours ups and downs as well. So I had a moment when I was finally like feeling good and then one of you two was not and that brought me back down again. In the miracle that the three of us are somehow in a good headspace all together, which I think doesn't happen because we take turns in a weird way. I think when you feel like one is up or two are up, you give yourself permission to like step down in like a weird way. So I kind of realized we're never all three gonna actually be leveled. And then I think another part of it is just, I think for like four years straight, our identity was as a unit. And I think there's just been a little bit more, I think desire to find individuality within the unit as well. Mm -hmm. And that gets even more complicated when an additional person is introduced into the dynamic. I think for you, Amar, even when you were in relationships, like it was almost like you kind of weren't sometimes, like because you were, like you just hang out with us all the time, and like the girl would be like kind of in the room sometimes, and you'd just be in the living room with us, and just like you just loved that aspect of it. But I think T Boogie, you're more of like a very much like a relationship person. Uh, so I think there was a much more drastic uh, shift in how often like we spent time together outside mm -hmm. of work, mm -hmm. um, which made me realize like this can't be a thing I depend on completely. Like I need to make I need to make new friends. I need to get my own relationships. I need to 
figure out other things that I like to do. Because I remember even like every weekend you and I would go up the PCH on those road trips together, right? right. And we'd like grab brunch, but then it kind of like abruptly ended. And I think that for me, I just like, I went to this like dark space where it was like, suddenly felt uh, like I hadn't invested enough in myself. Mm. I'd invested too much in others and in the group. Uh, and it scared me. I was like, damn. Like, what if I sacrifice everything for this and then everybody goes their own way and then I'm left with not having invested in my own stuff. That makes sense. I would love to continue doing the road trips. We don't have a car now, but mm -hmm. there's a lot of great things that came out of those trips. No, but I, but I do realize like I, I went into a cave a little bit and I think a part of it was just uh, like wanting to separate myself a little bit from over identifying and over reliance on like the business and the friendship for mental stability. And then that's when I was like, I need to like have something that is separate, uh, which is funny because I, that's like you started that. <laughs> You I started what? To, to start separate, myself? separate. Yeah. Where? By moving out. Mm -hmm. You were the first. You had a, We had an offsite. You were like, I can't be around you guys. <laughs> I can't live with you guys. Yeah. Now this happened before my time, but this is how I understand it went down. Those first days where the guys were living at 506 were literally the dream. What? First home, baby. First home. <laughs> <laughs> 506 yeah, Westminster, baby. You're all invited for a party in a Mars room. There were all sorts of different creative people staying at the house, and always something wild going on. It was a group of friends grinding, building, hustling, and experiencing life together. But after a few years of sharing walls and sometimes even beds, the stimulation became overwhelming for Matt. He's someone who relies on a bit of privacy, downtime, and quiet to reset after a long day. And he wasn't getting any of that. Living at 506 became this physical manifestation of his lack of autonomy, and he began to fight against it. He was like, guys, if we're gonna keep building, I gotta get out. That statement wasn't met with a whole lot of excitement from Thomas or Amar at first. To them, it felt like the magic of yes theory existed in the walls of 506, and that the serendipity of what made their friendship great happened only because they could wake up, sit on the couch in their boxers, and come up with a video adventure. This decision for Matt to put himself before the unit is completely understandable. He was sharing what he needed to become the friend and co-founder that he wanted to be. But to Thomas and Amar, it felt like a retraction. <laughs> so you were the first yeah. to do it. I just was like, all right, this is what we're doing, you know? Yeah. So I was like, holy shit, I need to find something that like grounds me in knowing who I am and who I want to be and not letting outside forces uh, or like anyone else, define what I am in a way. This is a pretty common inflection point in our closest relationships. When one person starts to move in a slightly different direction, we might panic a bit. It forces us to look in the mirror and ask, who am I without this? With Yes Theory, this is all magnified. Their friendship is literally on display for the world to pick apart. And maybe the worst part is knowing that they're constantly being compared. Whenever someone starts working with the team, they inevitably work up the nerve to ask which of the trio is my favorite. But that's like asking a mother to choose your favorite child. There's something about being in a group of three people doing the exact same thing, living the exact same life, where whoever comes into that circle essentially judges which of the three they like the most, you know? And you're like, for me, like, I mean, we, we joked about it, right? That it was like my thing where I was like competitive. Like I wanted to be better than you guys. But I struggled because I didn't have the, like, quote-unquote, sexier role. So I think a lot of my insecurities came from that. Um, boy bands break up for the very reason, you know? It's like young dudes in a fucking thing, all famous and making money and getting all this attention. And then you're like, but why does he get that? And I don't get that. Motherfucker. <laughs> you know? I mean, especially with Amar, because you make friends with fucking everybody. Like, for me, it was always like, oh, they'll like Amar better. Hmm. Wait till you meet Amar, you'll like him better. It was always my first reaction. Hmm. Whereas outside of this group, I was that guy. Hmm. 
which made it so difficult because I was like, even growing up, I was always like bringing all these friends home and like this popular kid. And then I got one up. <laughs> I was like, I have to live with this. <laughs> the constant reminder that I'm not as popular. Like I've talked to my dad about this where I was like, he's like, but you're, you're so good at making friends. And I'm like, dad, you, Amar is so much better than me. It's, you know, if that's my best skill set and he's better at me at that, what do I provide? You know, uh, but it, in all honesty, it's almost like a boot camp in self esteem. Like you need to figure out, like where you get validation from and how you feel fulfilled. Otherwise, you just get wrecked by this kind of shit. There's a balancing act at play here. Counting on your partners to give you validation when you need it, but also trusting yourself to build that self-worth independently. A friendship can last forever, but you also have to have like your own life mm. and your own relationships outside of this. I didn't really feel that way until, until like this year. And that's when I was like, oh, it feels like the foundation is shakier now. There's just so many different opinions coming at us. And Thomas and I were just talking upstairs about it. But I think more importantly, it's just like what we've been through together, like the discomfort on camera and off camera. Uh, I think because it's so deep, it's so impossibly hard for somebody to fully understand it. Mm. True friendship has to be so earned and has to go through, in my opinion, like that, that ugly shit, like the comparisons and the fights and the fucking envy. It's almost if you do, if you do friendship right, it becomes your mirror work for mm -hmm. your own growth. Because if you, people just seek that in relationships, I mean, the ones that are lucky enough to like realize that you're in a relationship that empowers you to find your own growth and have that be reflected back at you. Um, but I, I feel like we figured out very early on that we could do that with each other. Each member of Yes Theory empowers one another to find their own growth. And that could have easily been put into jeopardy when the team collectively decided that Matt should take a step back from hosting. But ultimately, that decision may have saved them from future heartbreak. It was a hard conversation and one that Yesir hasn't spoken about publicly until now. We'll get into it after the break. I remember the first time someone asked me if I meditated. I took it as a complete diss. I was like, damn, I must look really stressed for someone to be asking me that. Shortly thereafter, I took that diss and tried it anyway. Now I'm completely converted. I might not be as consistent as Thomas or Matt, but meditation is definitely one of the best tools in my toolkit. I personally think meditation is an absolute game changer for creativity, self-awareness, you name it. But I think the best part about it is not actually sitting down and being still, but how it translates over into other areas of your life. Mindfulness sounds like this woo-woo thing most of the time, but there's real benefit to being here now because the present moment is where all the best things in life happen. I'm an avid Headspace user, and not just because they're a sponsor of the show. I used the app way, way before that. And one of my favorite things has been to compete with friends on the app for daily streaks like which one of us can meditate for the most days in a row. It's a clever way of keeping yourself accountable and leveling up with your friends. You've already heard all the reasons why Headspace rocks, but let me just remind you, the app has hundreds of guided meditation sessions on everything from stress to sleep. There are SOS exercises for meltdown moments and mini meditations for busy days. There are tons of tools for helping you become more mindful. So seriously, go check it out. Start your journey toward a healthier, happier life with Headspace. Download the app today for free. You know what's severely underrated? Sleep. That's what. It's the first thing to fall off the to-do list when life gets busy. You think, eh, I can survive off three hours, right? Wrong. We both know well-rested you is a complete badass ready to crush your dreams, but exhausted you is less focused and more stressed and chugging a few too many afternoon Americanos. Or maybe that's just me. Point being, to be truly great, you've got to sleep great, and Purple is here to help. They've got patented grid technology that instantly adapts to your body's natural shape and sleep style. And with over 1,800 open-air channels designed to neutralize body heat, Purple provides a cooling effect that other mattresses can't replicate. Purple's cutting-edge comfort doesn't just stop with mattresses. 
Every Purple Pillow is engineered for total head and neck support and absolute airflow, so you're always on the cool side of the pillow. That's right. You can even try any Purple product risk-free with free shipping and returns. And Purple has financing starting at 0% APR. So what are you waiting for? It's time to get to sleep. Try the Purple Grid out by going to purple.com slash yestheory10 and use the promo code yestheory10. For a limited time, you'll get 10% off any order of $200 or more. That's purple.com slash yestheory10, promo code yestheory10 for 10% off any order of $200 or more. I've got a new podcast to tell you about. It's called The World As You'll Know It. It's five in-depth conversations with journalists and experts about how COVID-19 might change the nature of work, cities, higher education, and the economy forever. I can't be the only one feeling like it's hard to flip on any device and not be berated with negative news right now. We all know the pandemic has caused immeasurable loss of lives and livelihoods. It has shut down economies and forced billions of us to change the way we live. These are real issues coming to the surface that we can't just be flipping about. We have to use this moment to make progress towards a better, more equitable, and sustainable world. And in certain corners, that's what's happening. In the midst of chaos, a new future is being etched out. It's one that feels scary, but also has a lot of hidden possibilities. We are actively deciding what's on the agenda for the future of our world, and that's what the world as you'll know it is all about. The changes happening around us aren't just the big ones, like whether countries are deciding to take on more debt or not. The changes are also happening subtly in our everyday decisions, like whether we now decide to ride a bike or take the bus. Together, the millions of decisions we are making separately today are shaping what our collective tomorrow will look like. The World As You'll Know It is supported by Aventine, a nonprofit research institute whose aim is to invest in work that explores how today's decisions will affect the way we live, work, and experience life in years and decades to come. The World As You'll Know It is available now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever you get your favorite podcasts. After a brief hiatus, Amar, Thomas, and Matt began planning a road trip. They were going to load up in an RV with their whole crew and travel around the United States together for a few weeks. Matt never would have admitted it, but this was his worst nightmare. He'd confided in me that he finally felt like himself here at home, with the camera shut off. The years of back-to-back videos had taken a lot out of him, and he wasn't ready to jump back in. So when the trip started to morph from an idea to a plan, it became the impetus for a pretty intense conversation. I think Amar was the first to say it. Mm -hmm. I think you were like, I don't think it makes sense. He's not interested in hosting. Like, there's clearly friction, and it's just going to get worse if we, like, force him to do it. I felt that Matt wouldn't ask for it because it's, like, a core part of what we do. And it's not fun for, like, anyone. It took me a while to like wrap my head around that idea. I think we're giving we're giving each other a lot of space, but in the that. process in the process of giving each other that space, we're not communicating as much because we kind of can't distinguish between giving space but also communicating and checking in on each other's needs. And even though Amar suspected that Matt's unhappiness with hosting was a very real issue bubbling to the surface, he was reluctant to bring it up. So yeah, it felt like. If we didn't bring it up, it would probably take a long time for him to say it. Or a really bad like breaking point where like in the middle of an episode that we're being filmed, it's just something happens and then Matt walks out. As the road trip got closer and closer, Thomas and Amar realized that it was now or never. So they called together a team meeting. Did we go into this meeting ex- expecting to talk about this? I don't remember it, like preparing myself for it. Um, what was the meeting about? Go for we it. had talked about it. Yeah. Oh, you guys had talked about we it. We knew. Yeah. And Amara just kind of threw it out there. He said, hey, Matt, would you be okay if you didn't go on this road trip? There was an instant relief the second it came up. And we felt like Matt just like let go a little bit. And you could tell like he wanted to say that, but he just never got around to it. Mm-hmm. And I, I remember the first thing he expressed was exactly that. And once that can of worms had been opened, there was no going back. Uh, to me, it just felt like... It felt like the end of a chapter, in a way. Mm. Which is, I think, why I started to cry. Mm. That, yeah, I mean, I'll be in videos, but it's not like I'm gonna go back to what it was. Um, and... 
I think there was just kind of like a grieving for the end of that chapter, just being the three of us hosting together and like moving into something bigger than just videos. And what made me cry actually was just like, like the timeline, like where we came from to where we got and like how difficult it was, but how beautiful too. But all of a sudden I was kind of just like, well, what do I do? You know, if you guys are staying with this, you know, where am I going? And how do I not repeat the same mistake of falling into something just because I'm needed and not because I genuinely want to do it? And that's the upside of a sacred partnership. Sometimes when you get bogged down, your partners pick you up and remind you that you don't have to carry the weight alone. The way you guys responded to me not wanting to host took my love for you to the next level. Where it's a situation that just makes your life so much more difficult and puts a lot of things in jeopardy. But you've been like both so patient with me about like allowing me to just step back and figure out what, what I want to do next. The closer the relationship, the more uncomfortable it is to address a potential divergence. But that's the point of a sacred partnership like Yes Theories, to lean into those hard conversations and reinforce the love through your actions, even if those actions are calling a meeting. Matt's decision is just one of many complications that Yes Theories had to contend with and talk through, something that was unquestionably uncomfortable to sit through. I, I was a little surprised when you said that in that meeting for you was the end of a chapter. Hmm. Did you experience it like that? Mm. I didn't experience it like that at all. I don't think anyone else did. The density of events that happened in that period is yeah. completely blur blurring mm -hmm. so many things. It's unbelievable. What it's else like, is happening? Like the whole world is just collapsing. <laughs> to me, it was just genuinely like seeing a, a friend that's hurting and wanting to give him space to figure out what's causing it. But I mean, you have to understand from my end, because I think you're, like, obviously you're impacted by it, but like the way you operate isn't going to change as much, right? I think the reason I say it was the end of the chapter for me is just because it's like, the next thing is going to be different. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean like not working together and not like being in certain videos, but it's just overall, like the way I operate day to day is going to be so different. Right. Because like being a host was like, I mean, a full time thing for th that amount of time. That was our lives, you know, just like week to week. That's all you think about. It's like, what are we filming next? Where are we going? What's happening? I mean, that's just been our lives up to COVID. Like, I just don't even know what it looks like, whatever comes next. Mm. So it's impossible to say how it'll be different. Uncertainty. Communication is where growth happens, especially when it's uncomfortable. And almost two years after I first sat down with the guys, I reminded them of that first day where we workshop Simon Sinek's why statement together. What's it all for? I asked. I think healing. Becoming free children. Alongside them. And really, that's the purpose of all of this, for them to grow and share that growth together and with you. When I used to envision success, I thought of the two Steves, 
Steve Jobs, and Stephen King. I picture Jobs alone in a Bay Area garage grinding out the first Mac computer, and King alone in a main cabin, typing away. I only started to question that belief after an economics lecture in college. If life is so freaking short, I asked my professor, why prioritize competition over working together toward the common good? My professor said, well, everyone wants to be the hero of her own story. When we're so busy fighting to put ourselves front and center, we miss the opportunities to write better, stronger, and more meaningful narratives with the co-authors all around us. Maybe the Steves hadn't succeeded alone. So I went and looked it up. Tabitha King, Stephen's wife and muse, is his audience of one. She's the first person to see his crappy first drafts and who he leans on when a book doesn't smash the way he's used to. And Steve Wozniak, the co-founder of Apple. He doesn't get the spotlight often, but his contributions can't be understated. The phone in your pocket wouldn't exist without him. These two get reduced down to side characters, but Tabitha's life purpose isn't to support King's career, and Wozniak's role wasn't just channeling Jobs' genius. The King's shared purpose was a marriage, a family, and a life together. Wozniak and Jobs shared a vision of what Apple could one day become. Yes, theory isn't Thomas's or Matt's or Mars. It's not one main character with two side characters. Each has his own story and vision that's playing out, but they've committed to writing a narrative that's bigger than each of them individually. And if you want to do something truly great, whether that's build the next Apple, write the next Shawshank Redemption, or even start the next Yes Theory, the only way to do it is to surround yourself with people you love and respect. In pursuing our own personal success, development, and accolades, sometimes we forget to invest in the people around us. We are so concerned with becoming the heroes in our own stories that we decidedly ignore the important roles we play in other stories. And perhaps it's those roles in other stories that were truly written for us. It's those roles that we are truly destined to fill. So with that, I'm going to be the one that issues your challenge this week. And like this episode, it's a little different. Instead of looking within, go have a real open and honest conversation with someone you've been meaning to, whether that's your parent, a close friend, or a business partner. Start by telling the person what they mean to you and let it flow from there. You might be surprised to find you've got a lot to talk about. Share how this conversation made you feel on Instagram by tagging Yes Theory and using the hashtag Yes Theory Challenge. I'm your host for this episode, Kate Ward, but I would not be here without my favorite group of super cool and vulnerable friends, Mark Andiel, Matt DeHair, and Thomas Bragg. This episode was produced by Joy Folks and Juliette Luini. It was edited by Joey Fishground. Dan Kroll sound designed and mixed it right up. The S3 podcast is produced by me, Kate Ward, for One Day Entertainment. The executive producers are Leah Sutherland, Morgan Selzer, and Sam Rogaway from Headspace Studios.